Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. As part of this briefing, we'll have an opportunity for live Q&A with our experts, and we'll be offering these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit any questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. Before I introduce today's guests, I want to quickly share some slides and talk about the latest data. Hmm. Okay, it appears that I'm not able to, um, to share slides right now, so I'm going to go straight to our guests. Today, I'm joined by two of our experts. First, Dr. Brian Garibaldi is the medical director of the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit, and he's an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Brian will give an update about the treatment of COVID-19 patients. Also, we're joined by Dr. Bill Moss, who's the executive director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give us an update about COVID-19 vaccines. First, I'm going to turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Brian, I'll start with you. As a frontline provider, you now have roughly a year of experience treating COVID patients. What are you most concerned about right now, especially with the new variants? And do you see any promising developments? Perfect. Thanks, Lee. You know, I think the, the thing about the new variants is that um, it's not sure yet how they're in terms of what we're seeing in our hospitalized patients. And part of that is, you know, we, we really understand what's out there. You know, there are three or four variants that people are concerned about, but especially in the United States, we're not genotyping enough of the viruses to really understand what's out there. And so I think the current variants, um, you know, we know they're out there, we're concerned about them and they're under that until people are widely vaccinated, we need to do our best to keep this virus from circulating if variants don't pop up. But I think they're really an important reminder that we need to get better organized and really start genotyping these viruses so we can understand new variants as they develop and really be out in front of what those, those variants might do in terms of severity of illness, people, you know, potentially getting sick uh, with the vaccine. Um, you know, I think the other thing that, that I'm worried about and what we're seeing a lot in the hospitals is that we have a lot of patients who have chronic lung disease now related to COVID. And I think we're, we're just beginning to start to understand what that might mean. People who get very, very sick end up in the ICU, sometimes end up on a ventilator for months. Um, and, and I think we need to be in, begin to think gonna, uh, approach this whole new chronic disease that's gonna be related to COVID. Uh, I guess finally, a little bit about this weekend with the Super Bowl. Um, you know, I think we're just starting to see hospitalizations come, hopefully going to see deaths starting to come down. Uh, they usually lag behind by several weeks. And, and a lot of this was related to what happened over the holidays. And, and the Super Bowl is a huge event. I mean, it's something we many of us look forward to every year. I think people just need to uh, and remember that this is not the time to go hang out with a bunch of people that you haven't been hanging out with before. And being indoors at a bar or restaurant is a recipe for disaster, and I really hope we don't see another surge related to it. Um, you know, I think there are some some promising developments. You know, I was going to talk about there are new vaccines that are starting to to release their data, suggesting some efficacy against the virus. And you know, I think we're really going to be able to be in a better position in the coming months to prevent severe disease and death. Um, but I think we still have a long road ahead, and, and we need to remember that it's going to be a while before. The majority of our population is vaccinated. And we also need to remember that, you know, just vaccinating people in the U.S. is not enough. We really need to step up our ability to help internationally because, as we've seen with these variants, if there are hot pockets of virus that's circulating, that's up new variants and new mutations, um, and so that's something that we we need to step up our role internationally. Thanks so much, Brian, for um, for the explanations and also the the sound advice as we head into this weekend. Before I turn to Bill, I want to remind our audience, please submit any questions that you have in the box at the bottom of your screen, and we will um, shortly move to Q&A. But first, Bill, we're now hearing that additional COVID vaccines may soon receive emergency use authorization, EUA, in the next few weeks, um, and there continues to be much greater demand for vaccines than, than actual supply. Can you talk us through the latest news? 
Yes, a lot happening, Lainey, in the in the world of COVID-19 vaccines. You know, again, another busy week. I thought I'd start off with another feel feel good story. Last week, I told about the the public health uh, group in Oregon that got stuck uh, on a highway in a snowstorm after a tractor trailer jackknifed and and backed up the traffic and how they had a, another uh, an unused vial uh, and went around and were able to deliver six doses kind of on this highway as traffic was stopped. Um, yesterday, the New York Times reported that uh, there are there are young New Yorkers who are kind of reaching out in various ways to uh, older New Yorkers to try to help them get vaccine. And we know that in in many states, the the process for getting an appointment for vaccination is, is very cumbersome and requires spending perhaps many hours online and navigating uh, online websites in order to get an appointment. And so it's very heartening to see some younger New Yorkers who are more uh, computer savvy, savvy helping out uh, some of the older New Yorkers who aren't quite as computer savvy uh, to get their shots. So uh, a, a sign that we are coming together as a country uh, to try to get through this pandemic. So we in the, here in the United States, we continue to make a lot of progress in, in, in a increasing the number of people vaccinated. Um, more than uh, 57 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been distributed. We've vaccinated or administered more than 35 million doses. Um, that's about 60, just over 60%. Uh, so that uh, proportion has increased. Um, and we're, we're averaging now uh, about 1.5 million doses a day. Um, so we're above the Biden administration's uh, kind of goal of 1 million per day for uh, 100 days. And uh, the Biden administration is now calling for 1.5 or it suggested 1.5 million shots per day. Uh, so we're, uh, we still need to do better. Um, and I think we can do better. And, and hopefully we'll see more vaccine doses administered per day. Um, I'm going to, you know, kind of use my my simple framework of the four D's to talk a little bit more about uh, vaccine news, uh, doses, delivery, demand, and data. And so, in terms of doses, uh, you're right. We are seeing um, more data uh, this past week, and I think the big news today is that uh, the Johnson and Johnson applied for an emergency use authorization. Uh, folks will remember, you know, some of the advantages of the J and J vaccine is that it's single dose, um, it can just be refrigerated. Um, and we did see, uh, you know, 72% uh, efficacy in the United States. Um, folks may remember that that efficacy was lower um, in South Africa, um, only about 57%. Uh, uh, and so there is some concern, I'll come back to this, about lower vaccine efficacy uh, with these some of these uh, newer uh, va virus variants, uh, although the vaccines still seem to be very protective against uh, severe disease. So J&J &J vaccine, 85% effective in preventing severe disease. So what we're, we, what we're anticipating uh, in the coming weeks is that the advisory committee, the Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee uh, that advises the FDA will be uh, reviewing the, the phase three trial documents from Johnson & Johnson, um, and they'll be meeting on February 6th. So we, we may be seeing an emergency use authorization for this uh, vaccine uh, by the end of this month, and hopefully we'll have doses ready to go in early March. So this will be another large, potentially large infusion of new vaccine doses into the United States. On the global level, uh, the uh, Russian investigators published the results of their phase three trial with the Sputnik V vaccine, showing efficacy of 91.6%. Um, we'd heard uh, preliminary uh, results about this trial, and obviously this had, they had moved forward uh, perhaps more quickly than many people uh, would have uh, advised with this vaccine. But finally, we get to see very rigorous uh, phase three randomized control trial data on the Russian uh, Sputnik V vaccine. It looks very good. That's a 
an adenovirus vectored vaccine uh, actually uses two different human adenoviruses, adenovirus 26 and adenovirus 5. So very good for uh, the global uh, vaccine supply to have this Russian vaccine uh, show such high efficacy and a good safety profile. And we're also hearing from COVAX, which is the, the umbrella organization that's working to get vaccines out to all countries. Um, they just issued uh, their interim forecast. They're looking at close to 350 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, 1.5 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, getting those out this quarter or next quarter. So hopefully we'll see more equitable distribution of vaccines globally. This is critically important because this is a global pandemic and we need to uh, need to ensure that there, these vaccines are available uh, globally. Um, we are seeing uh, some issues around on the demand side. Uh, and, you know, I think of most concern and most of the news the past week have been some uh, more aggressive uh, stances taken by anti-vaxxers. Uh, people may have heard about at the Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, uh, where a group of anti-vaxxers actually blocked others from, from getting the vaccine. And I, I think this is really a, a, a terrible um, uh, event. Uh, you know, if people don't want to get va vaccinated, that's their decision, but they shouldn't be uh, obstructing others from getting vaccinated. Uh, on, uh, on the data side, um, the CDC did release uh, information on uh, some demographic characteristics of individuals who were vaccinated uh, during the first month of vaccine rollout in the United States. We are seeing inequities in, that, in those data. 63% um, uh, uh, were women, 55% uh, of, of people were over 50 years of age, and 60.4% uh, were non-Hispanic white. Only 5.4% uh, were black in that data set. And what was interesting to me, Lainey, 29% of people vaccinated were 18 to 39 years of age, so fairly young, um, and a very uh, almost identical 29% were over 65 years of age. So we're, we're not, doesn't look like we're really reaching that uh, older uh, adult population that are high risk of disease. But most importantly on the data side, uh, demographic uh, uh, characteristics on people vaccinated were missing from more than half of individuals. And uh, you and I have talked a lot about this in relation to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource uh, Center website and the need to have accurate uh, data on, uh, on people getting vaccinated. Thanks so much, Bill. I am now going to briefly share the slides um, that I wanted to show earlier, which pick up on themes that both Bill and Brian um, mentioned in, in their opening remarks. So let me just pull up those slides. So since we were last together last Friday for our, our briefing, the um, it's become pretty clear that the United States is coming down off of what was an extremely high peak early in January. The uh, and that's that's certainly good news. This um, this chart is showing new daily new cases, but it's also worth noting that this green line that shows the United States is still higher than where we were at our previous high peak, which happened over, over the summer. So things seem to be going in, in a good direction, but we need to keep it in perspective. If you look towards the bottom of this chart, you can see in terms of daily new cases, um, distantly behind the US and the orange line is Brazil, the pink line is Spain, and then that red line shows that the UK also seems to have turned a corner and is coming down off of the peak that it experienced um, earlier this year. I also wanted to mention that since we were last together for a briefing, the United States has unfortunately surpassed 450,000 deaths related to COVID. My last two slides show a few new features on the Coronavirus Resource Center site, and I wanted to quickly preview them for all of you. A few weeks ago, I showed you how we have added a vaccine tracker to our site that tracks status of vaccination in each of the 50 states in the United States. We have now um, added additional capability to the site. And so what you're seeing here on the left-hand side of the slide, we are showing international vaccine efforts and 
this data can be sorted in a variety of ways. So here on the left hand side, I'm showing you alphabetical by country and on the right hand side, I'm showing you these same data, but this time they're sorted to show percent of those who are fully vaccinated by country. So this is a resource that we will, um, that we will continue to invest in and, and work on with the site. Finally, another feature that we um, recently launched shows hospitalization data for the United States and also breaks it down for each of the 50 states. So very quickly, if you look at this, this um, data visualization, you'll see that the teal colored um, bottom portion of each bar shows the non-COVID inpatient beds that are being used. Then the orange portion of each bar shows the COVID beds, um, COVID inpatient beds that are being used. And finally, the gray portion at the top of the bar shows inpatient beds that are not occupied. And these are this is showing week by week. So each bar is one week. If you hover over the bars, which I'm not able to do um, in this briefing, you get additional information that provides percentage of beds um, in each of those categories. So I'm going to stop sharing now and we'll move straight into our Q&A. And thank you to everyone. I see we've had lots of questions coming in so far. And I want to remind everyone, please continue to submit questions. We're anxious to answer them during this briefing. OK, Bill, first question over to you. Is it true that after um, being vaccinated, even though the spike pro proteins are blocked, that the SARS-CoV-2 virus can still replicate inside an individual's body, potentially causing future problems? Um, so the, the vaccines will uh, neutralize the virus um, before they get into the cell. Um, but it may be, you know, there, there, it's possible that, that the vaccines don't completely prevent um, the virus from, from entering uh, our body, um, but, uh, but it prevents kind of further replication of the virus. Um, virus the, these viruses, that maybe the most important answer to this is that coronaviruses do not cause persistent infection. Um, there are viruses that persist in our bodies, herpes, uh, the herpes simplex virus would be an example, or the, or the chicken pox virus. Um, but coronaviruses don't persist. So they're cleared by our immune system. And so there's no reason to think that there would be any long-term uh, persistence of of SARS coronavirus 2 in our bodies that would cause long-term complications, even if uh, there are small numbers of cells infected in a vaccinated individual. Thanks, Bill. This next question is one that um, I know many, many of us are anxious to have answered. What do we know about research to determine whether the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines actually um, prevent individuals from spreading the virus? Yeah, so the, the, it's a, it is a really important question, and um, there are uh, studies ongoing looking at this. They're, 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 these are difficult studies to do. Um, what we heard this past week in the news was the, uh, some reports about uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and it, it did get somewhat misinterpreted, um, but it, what it was shown by, uh, by the tr in the trials for the AstraZeneca vaccine, basically they asked uh, participants to swab their nose every week and then they looked for virus there. Um, and they showed a, a, a marked reduction in what we'll call asymptomatic infection. Now one can uh, suppose that if you reduce asymptomatic infection, you're going to reduce uh, uh, transmission. But a study to look at transmission actually has to look at the contacts of those individuals and see if they get infected. So it's a more complex study to actually document uh, transmission. What we can uh, surmise is that um, the, even with the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, um, uh, the fact that they reduce uh, you know, mild, moderate, or severe disease or symptomatic disease 
probably reflects the fact that they reduce the viral load um, in individuals. And by reducing the viral load, they're going to have some impact on transmission. Whether that's down to zero, it, it probably won't be, but they will have, I'm confident that they will have an impact on, on transmission just because of the, the way uh, they reduce uh, disease and thus uh, are reducing viral loads. Thanks, Bill. Um, this this next question has a vaccine element and a clinical element. So Brian and Bill, I'm going to invite you both to, to weigh in on this. For someone with um, a transplanted organ and on immune suppressants, are they able to build immunity to COVID-19 by getting vaccinated? I thought you both might want to weigh in on this one. Yeah, so, so I think in, in general, we worry that people who are on immunosuppressive medications won't mount as robust a response uh, to the vaccine, but that, that transplanted patients who have been infected with COVID, many of them do mount an anti antibody response afterwards. So if you measure their antibodies after their infection, they do have antibodies to COVID. Um, so I think it's a really individualized case. People are on different suppressive regimens and their immune systems are at sort of various depending on where they are post-transplant. So I think in general, it, it's likely that many of them will, but on a case-by-case ca case case basis, it's not clear what the overall impact of the vaccine will be on all of the patients. Thanks, Brian. Bill, did you want to add? I, I agree with Brian. I think the, the more, uh, the more uh, severe the immunosuppressive uh, regimen is, um, perhaps there's a, a lower likelihood of developing a full protective efficacy, um, but these vaccines are still recommended for people who are taking immunosuppressive drugs, uh, and they're likely to have some impact, and we don't want those patients to get COVID-19. Thanks, Bill. Um, Brian, question, question for you about actually um, getting vaccinated against COVID, which you have been. So folks are hearing that um, some people get a fever with the, the first or or second dose, um, what's the recommendation? Just take Tylenol. And can you talk a little bit about your own experience getting vaccinated? Um, so it is, it is very possible that people are gonna experience some symptoms after the vaccine. These are what we call reactogenic vaccines, and that's probably a good thing. It means the immune system is, is responding. So you know, many people have local site uh, injection reaction, and they might have a little bit of pain or a couple of days. Fever is common and is a little bit more common in, in people after the second dose of the vaccine, after your immune system has been primed and then, and then sees these proteins again. Um, in general, the, these uh, reactions are self-limited. They're not life-threatening. Um, and we are not currently recommending that people try to anticipate who's going to have a reaction and try to pre-treat themselves with any medications. Um, you know, after you just have to you know, monitor their symptoms and, you know, it's okay to, to take a pain reliever and anti-inflammatory post-vaccine. Uh, but we don't widely recommend taking them beforehand because, you know, we're not, we don't think that it's going to diminish the efficacy of the vaccine, but that's not the way the studies were, were conducted. And if we really want people to have the, the most robust immune response, we should try to recreate what was done in those studies. Personal experience, you know, honestly, after the first dose that night, I had a little bit of a headache, um, but it wasn't even enough to, for me to to take anything for. And I'd say after the second dose, I just felt a little bit more tired than usual for a couple of days, but I, I did not have a fever. I was at work every day. I did time it so that I wasn't on call uh, for the day after, just in case I had an intense reaction. Um, but otherwise I, I did fine and, and uh, no, no problems. Thanks, Brian. And can you speak about which vaccine you received and whether folks should expect to have a choice among vaccines? Yeah, so I, I received the Pfizer. Um, that would be what we had at our hospital on that given day when my lottery number came up to get vaccinated, and I would have happily taken either the Pfizer or the Moderna. I think at this point, um, it's unlikely that people are going to be able to shop around to get one or the other, and, and the efficacy data for both and this are very, very similar. They're very similar vaccines in terms of the mRNA components that go into them, um, and honestly, I would just take whatever vaccine is available and be very happy about it. Thanks, Brian. Bill, question for you, and, and this is something that um, that we've talked about quite a bit, and I know is of great concern to many of us. It, it, it concerns um, culturally relevant materials in the context of the pandemic, but even more so for for the vaccine and making sure that we are reaching um, particular 
um, populations, including the African American community and, and other groups where, where we're already seeing inequities in the vaccine rollout. Do you have thoughts about that? Yes, this is a such an important uh, issue, Lainey, and it's it's obviously a very complex one and hard to address very briefly, but there's no doubt that we need to have very targeted public health messaging to help build confidence and uh, address concerns about uh, about these vaccines, particularly in African American communities um, and other uh, disadvantages disadvantaged communities where we know the pandemic has been uh, really terrible uh, and taken a big toll. Um, there was a recent uh, study that came out uh, from a survey this past week um, suggesting some differences. It was kind of interesting in the acceptability of uh, COVID-19 vaccines in the African American communities with younger African Americans actually being more reluctant uh, to accept a vaccine. So we need that kind of information. We need to understand what the concerns are so we can give targeted uh, uh, messages. And we also need to to, to be very active in bringing the vaccines to these communities. So it's not just a, a, a demand issue, uh, and, and but also overcome any kind of access issues. But a, a very important uh, problem, we need to reach out to the community leaders and basically the influencers in those communities, get them on board uh, to help craft messages um, that are really targeted to the concerns of those communities. Thanks, Bill. Brian, question for you. What do we know so far about the so-called COVID long haulers and how the virus lives in, in their bodies and, and what's happening to them? Yeah, so so we're learning every day. This is something that, you know, I was sort of alluding to earlier, you know, when I was talking about people who end up, you know, with chronic lung disease, th those aren't really the long haulers. Those are people who are in the ICU and had lung damage from, from uh, their initial COVID infection. You know, long haulers. These are people who have symptoms that persist months after their vaccine, months after their infection. And as Bill was talking about before, you know, the coronavirus is no longer actively present in their bodies. And what we're dealing with is likely, um, in, in many cases, some immune-mediated reaction or, you know, damage that was done during acute infection that then lingers and manifests in other ways. And I think. You know, we're, we're obviously concerned about the lung issues, potentially we're concerned about cardiac issues, we're concerned about neurologic issues and things like depression or anxiety that could be through that initial infection. We still don't exactly understand the mechanism and this is like, we're gonna be studying for years. Um, and, and it's really important that people as they experience these symptoms, you know, are, you know, get in touch with their primary care doctors and, and lots of study ongoing to try to follow people over time to really what's going on and, and as important to figure out how we can address some of these symptoms. Thanks, Brian. And Bill, a, a related question for you. Do the COVID vaccines have, have the potential to mitigate or, or lessen this long hauler phenomenon? Well, certainly by, by decreasing, uh, you know, the number of people who get symptomatic disease, I would say yes. I mean, we don't have really long-term follow-up uh, on individuals who were vaccinated, um, but uh, because we just started vaccinating in, in uh, mid to late December. Um, but I would say by preventing, uh, by preventing disease, uh, the vaccines will prevent uh, these long hauler symptoms. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Brian. We're coming uh, right up on 12.30, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap up now. I'd like to thank both of our experts, Brian Garibaldi and Bill Moss, for joining me this afternoon. Give a big thank you to everyone who um, joined us in our audience, and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer today. This briefing will be archived and available at coronavirus.jhu.edu. And as a reminder, we will be offering regular 30-minute briefings on Fridays at 12 p.m. In each briefing, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic, and we'll have live Q&A with our experts. I'll look forward to seeing you at our next 30-minute briefing. And until then, thanks and stay safe.